know who you're supposed to share Jesus with. Of course that would be the right answer, right? With everybody. But how do you know who's ready? How do you know who Jesus wants you to actually stop, and spend some time with? And Rebecca, I didn't see you back there. We have to do the whole picture again. No? Rebecca didn't get applauded for. Did I miss somebody else? <laughs> she should just call out the names and not try to go with what your eyes see. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. So how, how do you know? And how do you know what spiritual things that person might be dealing with that might be hindering them from coming to know Jesus? We don't just see it just by looking, can we? Not generally speaking. It really takes the power of the Holy Spirit. It takes the work and the anointing of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to actually lead us into situations. And here's the really cool thing. You don't have to force it. God will give you appointments if you will respond. What you need to be is willing to look for those appointments he's giving you and simply do what he says. It's interesting, as Jesus prepared to send out the disciples, you have to remember that he had just taught them a lesson on rejection. And like I said last week, salesmen will tell you that 85% of people that you try to sell something to are going to tell you what? No! no. no. <laughs> and so... Isn't that thing going to also happen probably with some people that you share and invite to come to Christ, invite to worship, invite to vacation Bible school? People may say what? No. They may say no. And they're saying that because they don't like you, you're a terrible person, all those little kinds of reasons, right? Not at all. It's not about you, remember? It's not about you. God's giving you appointments and it takes time and we're planting seeds and those invitations, we're actually listening to people when we invite them. And, and, and if we're really caring and hearing what they're saying, they may say, oh, I can't go because we've got to go to see my father. He's having heart surgery that week. And you say, oh, well, that's too bad. You just missed an opportunity that they were just sharing with you something. You see, it's so important that we learn to listen to people. It's probably the, our greatest witness does not come from all the things we say, but from what we listen to by taking the time to hear what people are saying. So Jesus is sending out the disciples, and he's, remember, at the end of his ministry on earth, after his resurrection, he ascends to heaven. Right before that, he says, all right, guys, I've taught you for three years. Go and make disciples of all the nations. But remember this also, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. And he's gonna send them out, and in fact, um, he is going to equip them with resources through the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he's asking them to do. We're going to hear more about that in a few moments as we look at the text from Mark 6 this morning. But, but Jesus is telling them, go and make disciples and realize that you're going to experience rejection. Don't be afraid of rejection. In fact, what Jesus' point about rejection was this. Look, guys, I just went to my hometown to the people that I know the best and the people who know me the best, the people who have watched me grow up, my brothers, my sisters, neighbors and family and friends, cousins, relatives, other people. And they've, they've known what kind of a worker I've been. They've known what kind of a carpenter I've been. They've known all about me. I just went there, guys. And what happened? This is my second time with them where they rejected me again. The first time they wanted to throw me off a mountaintop. Now they simply just ignored me. They simply don't believe. And it's so troubling for Jesus that Jesus, one of only two times in Scripture, says he's amazed. He's amazed at their unbelief. He's amazed that they don't believe even the miracles that he's performed. They don't believe. They're rejecting him. 
And Jesus' ministry literally kind of turns a corner at this point. Not only does he leave Capernaum, he's come up to Nazareth, he's going to leave Nazareth, he's going to be starting doing more ministry in villages and places, he's going to go in and out of Jerusalem, he's going to get all kinds of negative reaction there, but his ministry takes a shift at this point, and now he starts to clearly and intentionally focus on these disciples and getting to get them ready for the ministry that they're going to do. He's releasing the ministry into their hands. He's preparing to die on the cross. He's preparing to pay the ultimate price of rejection, and that's death. And he'll do that in order to buy freedom for all who will believe. So we're in our series on making disciples, and this week we're looking, the title that I've given for this message is, Go to Those Who Are Receptive. Go to Those Who Are Receptive. Mark, the sixth chapter, just a few verses, verses 7 through 13. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two. And he gave them authority over impure spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. Whoops. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. When Jesus... You see, when Jesus sent out the 12 disciples, he, he's getting them ready. And look at the things that he has them do. He says, first off, he tells them, okay, guys, here's, here's what I want you to do. Okay, this is basic stuff, all right? Let's, let's start with the easy stuff. I want you to go out, and you have power over impure spirits. So cast out demons, heal the sick, and call people to repentance, okay? It's the easy stuff. We'll get to the tough stuff later, <laughs> Okay? Now, most of us are sitting there saying, wait a second, I think that's a graduate degree, right? We're going to cast out demons. Um, it, it's interesting, um, one, one theologian talking about this, he says, now some of the specifics in this account obviously are unique to the apostles, namely the ability to do miracles. We don't have those powers, but the general features that he required of them, he still requires of us. Translated, what that... What that gentleman is saying is you don't get to do that kind of stuff today you don't have to worry about that you don't have that kind of power to cast out demons heal the sick and even to call people to repentance but there's some general things here we can learn about that and we'll get into that when we talk about how many tunics to wear what you're supposed to put on your feet in other words how you're supposed to dress when you go talk to your neighbor I'm sorry but I'm not thinking that that's the most important stuff of how I dress to go see my neighbor unless it's about how I dress my heart Unless it's how I dress my attitude and my mind and my behaviors and live in such a way that people see and smell the aroma of Christ in me, then that probably matters. But I'm thinking that maybe where Jesus starts out in this text may even be more significant. And it's sad to me that some of us in the Christian community have said, oh no, that stuff all stopped. I'm sorry, could, let's take a quick vote. How many believe there's still a Satan? How many say, no, no Satan? How many believe there's still a God? How many would say, no, no God? Folks, if there's still Jesus and there's still Satan, what about the minions? And and I'm not talking about the the little cartoons, okay? (laughs) I know, the movie's out, right? Yeah, the movie's out now, and see, 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 have you noticed what Hollywood does for us? Have you noticed what darkness wants to do to us? Either we're going to laugh about them as the minion, right? <laughs> or, oh, oh and, and Hollywood's really done a good job of this. 
there, and there's a new one coming out about exorcism again. And, and, and Hollywood wants us to be afraid of evil and its power and its danger and all that. And yet at the same time, oh, but that's just you know, a movie, not really real. Here's the facts, folks. Jesus did not destroy all the demons when he came here. There were more, I know there were a couple thousand or more, possibly four to 6,000 that were in that one guy, but that wasn't all, <laughs> okay? When, when scripture talks about Satan uh, being thrown out of heaven and the, from guys with him, people with him, it says that the third of the host of heaven, that's a big group, more than just a couple thousand. Jesus didn't take care of all the demons, but he did give authority yeah, wind's blowing across something, and I don't know what. He did. Hey, that could be cool, and the sound of a mighty wind. Okay, watch out, folks. <laughs> he did give authority to his disciples and to his followers to stand against evil. Folks, we don't need to be afraid. We don't need to be afraid of dealing with Satan because the fact is most of us never deal with Satan. We're dealing with minions. So maybe you need to go watch the movie and realize that demons are just as goofy as that, okay? And that they have less authority and less power than, than we all think. <clears throat> Puritan Philip Brooks said, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers. Pray for powers equal to your tasks. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, for your powers are pathetic. But pray for powers, divine powers, equal for your tasks, for the things that God is calling you to do. The disciples had power, authority given to them by Jesus Christ to go out and change their world. Look at it in Acts chapter 2. Or let me back up, I can't skip this one. What did Jesus say? He says, go back to Jerusalem. And he says, I want you to wait and I want you to pray. This is after he's, he's getting ready. He's ascending up into heaven. He sends them back to Jerusalem. He says, there's one thing you need to do. Go back and wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. But you will receive power, Acts 1.8, when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be what? My witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. It's a challenge. Maybe one of the reasons why we're not doing a good job is witnessing because we're doing it in our power rather than the power of the Holy Spirit. The authority that God gives to us. Acts 2 said it this way. And this is after now that, that spirit that they were waiting for. Holy Spirit comes upon them. And people thought they were drunk. At 9 a.m. in the morning. It's kind of an interesting thing. They're, they're partying and drunk at 9 a.m. Okay, that, that didn't quite fit. But that's what they thought. And they heard the noise. And they, they saw the tongues like fire. And they could each understand in his own language, which was an amazing gift of God. And another reminder, God is the one who helps people to listen and understand. You don't have to force it. God is the one who saves. It's not you and me. But he does allow us to be part of the party. He allows us to join in in sharing the stories. So Acts 2 says, verse 16, no, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And Peter's explaining what's taking place and these people are seeing it and it's like, oh man, this is crazy. And he said, in the days by, by the prophet Joel, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit, where? On all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Lord will be saved. The Spirit of God is coming upon the people. And when is that? Because here's the challenge. What some of us say, and some theologians have said, is when the Bible was complete, we didn't need this power any longer. That may be Suzanne's. Oh, good. <laughs> That, that may be an amen or it may be an argument. <laughs> 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 
It, we have been taught some that the, the Bible was finished back at what? Well, around the 300, right? Isn't that when Constantine accepts Christ? And isn't that when he says, okay, Romans, we're all Christians now. And we started moving into a whole process of time in which we exalted certain spiritual leaders because you know y'all people out there couldn't understand the words. We had to keep it from you and protect it. And we put people up into Kleros positions and then we kept Laos people down until we went into the Reformation and finally people started getting the word of God and lives were being changed again. People were starting to accept Jesus and they actually said, you know what? I need to get baptized again now because I got baptized as a baby, but that was for mom and dad. I need to get baptized for me because I need to make a commitment that's my own for Jesus Christ. I need to make it real for me. I need to accept him. Amen? Amen. Yeah, you talk about that when we baptize you. <laughs> <laughs> And that's because he's committed to getting baptized. Okay, that's not my t f telling him to do something, okay? Just so y'all know, somebody's thinking, you know, oh, you're getting rude to Mick again. You know? God has been equipping and anointing his church with the power of the Holy Spirit. It was in the 70s when I went to seminary. And John Wimber was a teacher at the school, uh, Fuller Theological Seminary. And he had a class, and he and Peter Wagner, interesting, this was in the School of Missions. Yeah, you need to check this out. Why is it that in most of the seminaries where they've talked about miraculous powers, where they've talked about the ability for God still to heal people, for the Holy Spirit to still anoint and empower people, why is it that in those seminaries that, that, that was almost always in the School of Missions? rather than the school of theology. You need to examine why that, that happens. And here's one of the reasons why. Because missionaries get out there on the scene and they run into demonic powers. They run into powers of darkness and evil and they have to stand against them. And if they don't use the power of God, they're stuck with, don't know what to do about this, but I hope it goes away fast. And you talk to missionaries who have been out there in the field and you set them down where it, they won't get in trouble because their theology might be different than the sending agencies. And you ask them about the spiritual forces they've had to deal with and they'll tell you stories that are a little bit scary at times. Because darkness is real. Well, the other thing that modern theology has said, I've told you this one, modern theology has tried to say, oh, that's only because they're in countries where they believe they're demons. And if you're not in a place where you believe there's demons, then there's no demons. So in America, we don't have to worry about demons. We just don't believe they're out there, so we don't have to deal with it, right? I'm not thinking that's very true. And Wimber, at a very important time, was teaching this class, and it was a class that they actually had then prayer time after class. Yeah, after a seminary class. And in those prayer times, they were praying for healings, and people had demons that were cast, and all kinds of stuff happened and all, and it was in the School of Missions. Later, Wimber, actually, you might, some of you might know, some of you maybe have been involved in Calvary Chapel. Wimber and Chuck Smith were like this. They, I mean, Wimber was like one of his main pastoral leaders in Calvary Chapel movement. And they, the two of them split, sadly, and a whole new ministry developed. It's called the Vineyard Movement. And all kinds of churches have exploded in the process in a positive kind of a way. And, and they they. they disagreed at one of these places, and one of the key places they disagreed was the presence and the power and the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, that was back in the 70s. Now, church historians are looking back. Yes, now, that's my history when I was a kid. <laughs> now, now, they're looking back at us old people from back there in the 70s, and they're saying that that was a movement called the second movement of the Holy Spirit. The first movement being Azusa Street, second movement being here where, and, 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 and Wimber talks about it, he says, he says, you know, you don't have to speak in tongues for this movement, but things go better with tongues. That was kind of his fun statement. And here's, the, here's the point, that today we're talking about a third movement of the Holy Spirit. In fact, historians are looking at the 90s for that one and saying that the Holy Spirit is being, has been poured out on mainline, even churches who don't ever want to do this weird thing like, you know, speak in tongues, but they want the power of God. 
And God's actually been gracious and said, fine, you don't have to have that gift, but let's still do some powerful things because I want to equip you to reach this world for Christ. Folks, evil's out there, and God has given us authority. You and me, anyone who knows Jesus, power of the Holy Spirit's in you, and you personally have authority to stand against those powers. Are you ready? Amen. Some of you are saying, I'm not sure I want to say yes because he might tell me I have to go do something. <laughs> Maybe. <clears throat> what did the disciples get told they were supposed to do? Well, not only were they supposed to go out with authority over evil, but they had a next job, and that was call people to repentance. Call people to repentance. It's a tough word, isn't it? The dedication of the temple, Solomon said, and speaking on behalf of God, and God really saying, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and turn, in other words, repent, turn from their wicked ways, then I'll hear from heaven and I'll heal their land. Repentance is a tough word because it means an actual change in direction. It means a, a clear and definite, I'm going to stop this, I'm going to start following Jesus, I'm going to start doing his will. Repentance is tough because the, here's the fact. Do you, all of you know when you sin? Yes. Don't most of you, come on. Yeah, most of you know it. Don't you think that most of the people sitting out there who don't know Jesus, don't you think they kind of know sometimes when they sin too? I mean, they may not like you to use the word. They may not want to talk about it. They may not want to admit it. In fact, they want you to even say, no, that's not a sin. And you can use that phrase for all kinds of stuff. Oh, no, it's just my disease. It's just my upbringing. It's just my whatever. No, but God's not saying that. No, he knows and we know. So what all the disciples had to say is instead of saying, look here, I got to point out exactly what you're doing wrong or what you're doing wrong or what you're doing wrong. He doesn't say that at all. He just says, go out and say, repent. Jesus is coming. Repent. Get ready to meet Jesus. Repent. Brothers and sisters, friends, hey, y'all and us, me, here today, what does God want from us? Repent. Repent. Ah, but in the church, isn't it easier to sit down and look and say, huh, that person should repent. Or that person should repent. Or the guy up front should repent. And it, you know, it's really easy to see the stuff in the other people. That's why Jesus said, you know what? You worry about the plank in your own eye before you're concerned about that speck, that splinter that's in your neighbor's eye. Now, that wasn't saying don't talk to them and repent, but don't be just get all focused on their stuff. He says, deal with your stuff too. Repent. God wants the church to repent. In Acts 17, verses 24 through 30, Paul's actually preaching and he says, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built in human hands. And he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should breathe and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. And God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of your own poets have said, and by the way, he's speaking to Greeks, if you didn't realize that. And he says, by your own poets have said, we are his offspring. Therefore, since we are God's offspring, we should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. 
We are simply to call people to repentance. We do that. We tell our stories and we invite people. If you think you've sinned, come, repent. Jesus will welcome you. People know they've sinned. The Holy Spirit does a pretty good job of convicting. We simply need to say, come, repent. And it starts with us. If my people will humble themselves, turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven and heal this land. Repentance begins here, not out there. Folks, we need to recognize receptivity. We need to be able to see when somebody's responding, when somebody has a need, when somebody's saying, pray for me, and we, and we say, um, okay, or yeah, I'll put that on my prayer list. I'll take that to the church and have them pray. No, when somebody says, pray for me, what should we do? Find a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> no, not fine. You, you, you should pray. But I don't know how to pray. I don't pray well. I don't pray like, you know, somebody who can p put all that King James language. I don't even know who King James is. So how do I do all that? And you don't have to do it anyway, but do it. We need to be more aware and listen to people and the opportunities that are aware. And we need to be a praying for the opportunities that people are giving to us for us to care about them. And then respond. Jesus said this. He says, these were his instructions. Mark telling us, and now Jesus says, take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts, wear sandals but not an extra shirt or an extra tunic, an extra outer robe. That's gonna make you look like you're really special, by the way, okay? The, the, you wore the second robe because you're more important. Uh, you, you have more money, you're more special. No, no, go simply, he says. And, and whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. Don't be looking for who has the best food. Just whoever welcomes you, stay there. You need to know that there was a law, basically. It was a cultural law that if a stranger came to town, what were you supposed to do? Welcome them into your home. Welcome them. Allow them to sleep in your home, feed them. Uh, we're kind of a little bit more nervous about strangers in our culture, aren't we? We're probably not gonna, somebody drives up, just got to Crestline. Oh good, come on over. I'll find somebody where you can stay. <laughs> Maybe I'll put you up in a room at the shadow, Mountain Shadows, or whatever they're called. Um, uh, no, no. We are supposed to, and here's the, the, the people in Jesus' day, they were welcoming people w e openly. And of course you welcome another Jew. Now, I don't know if they did that with a Gentile. That'd be another story. It says, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. As he's doing this, you know, what, what Jesus actually had his disciples doing is, is, look, I want you to go out, cast out demons. You've got authority over them. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to care about sick people. In fact, wouldn't that be one of the things that might show us some receptivity? Watch for somebody who has some kind of a personal need and care about them. You hear about somebody that's going into the hospital. Oh, too bad for you. No, <laughs> care about them. Maybe you're the person who shows up on their door site with food for them or their family. You're the one who says, you're going into the hospital. Do you mind if I pray for you? If they tell you no, what should you do? Pray about them, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> you should still pray. You should still pray. But here's the thing. I dare you to do it. I dare you to talk to somebody who's struggling, who's, who's going to a hospital, who's got a surgery or something like that going on in their life, and you, I dare you to say, may I pray for you? I, in fact, I double and triple dare this one. <laughs> you say it, and you see what they do. Because here's the fact that probably will happen. 99% of them will say, will you? Thank you. Even the ones who don't believe there's a God out there. You know, if you do, then they hope that he'll listen. So 
Pray with people. Look for people who are sick and hurting and in need. Hebrews 2, 4 says, and they verified it with signs and wonders and various deeds among, under the power of the Holy Spirit. Guess what? People want to see whether there's a God or not. And when God answers those prayers and you've prayed for them, they start saying, well, maybe what I've been believing isn't accurate. Maybe there is a God because God still does do miracles. God still has a, is at work. James 5 said it this way, is anyone among you sick? Is anybody sick? Then let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. And the Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. If you know God, God listens to you. And you can pray for them. Have you ever anointed somebody with oil? Do you know how to do it? You have to do it just the right way, right? Well, I had a friend that he hadn't, didn't know how to do it, so he went and got a whole bottle of olive oil. And he did. <laughs> Let me pray for you. And he poured the oil from head, and it went to toe. <laughs> and I'm sure that there was so much oil on him that um, he didn't need prayer, did he? No. <laughs> you know, they, they believed back in Jesus' day that oil had some healing agents in it. And so w were they doing it for that? Oh, okay, we need to put on oil because that's what heals. No, it was a way to get the attention of the people to say, look, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to put some oil on you. And, and what I suggest is that it's not how, about how much oil. I don't think if you do one ounce versus 13 ounces or 16 ounces that, oh, no, God's not going to listen to that one. In fact, what I like to do, I, do, I like the fragrant oil just because I like the fact that it leaves a fragrance later, a reminder later. And, and I simply like to take and make the sign of a cross on somebody's forehead. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Oh, he's, didn't he just do a crucifix on the forehead? I don't think there's anything wrong with the symbol of a cross, is there? In a simple little way. But what's more important than that? Not the magic of the oil. It's my obedience and my faith that as I now pray for you, God's listening. Not because I'm special, but because God's special. Not because I have all this ability to now heal this person. In fact, Scripture says that God gave the gift of healings to the church, not healers. And that therefore, any one of you who believes in the power of God and God calls you, God can work through you and anoint somebody with healing. Do you believe that? He says we're supposed to care for the sick. You're supposed to go out there. You're supposed to connect with the people that you meet. Find homes and meet people. And then they'll welcome you into their house. And look for the people who welcome you into their house. And if they don't welcome you, well, then what are you supposed to do? Well, you're supposed to go on. It's very simple. Travel lightly. You don't have to go with all of your Bible books to go witness to your neighbor. You might be better off taking your shovel if they've got snow on their front yard or taking your weed eater if they need the yard cleaned or something else like that to go minister, in other words, to them physically and to help meet a need and thereby start sharing Jesus with them. Look for that kind of openness in people who welcome you in. Incidentally, here's a really significant little note. Jesus sends out the 12. He sends them out how? in twos. Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons didn't have it first, okay? Jesus sent the disciples out in groups of two. What that means when the kids come back is that we have 30 more minutes before we're done, right? <laughs> okay. Jesus sends them out two by two. There is, a, there is a, some value in us ministering to people with somebody else. What did Jesus say? Wherever two or more of you are gathered together in my name and you're gonna ask anything, there I am, I'm in the midst of you and I will do it. There's, this, there's a, something significant and powerful in two of us ministering together and ministering to other people. It's why our life groups are praying with people for other people to come to know Jesus. It's why our life groups then do barbecues and things like that to invite people to get connected to them, to build relationships with one another because there's value in us doing this together. It's why I like doing ministry with my bride. 
because it's fun, it's special, and there's resources that we bring together that either the one or the other doesn't have. And sometimes when we get discouraged when we're ministering to somebody, it's helpful to have somebody else to say, don't give up. In fact, let me pray for you while we're praying for them. And Jesus knows the value of us going with twos. Did you realize that all 12 disciples went out? Mark chapter three, it talks about the disciples being called to follow Jesus. In fact, they're identified there. Do you remember the last two names on that list? Last two names in the list of the 12 apostles. 12 men who are going to be going out, six groups of two. They're gonna go out and do what? They're gonna cast out demons, they're gonna heal the sick, they're gonna preach repentance, and, and if you look at the end of Mark, the sixth chapter, it says that they came back and they're celebrating the fact that demons listened to them, that God healed through them, and miracles have been taking place. Luke 10 talks about when the 70 came back, also in groups of two, and Jesus says, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven because you were out there ministering. and and. The amazing stuff is going on. Who were the 12 that went out? The last two in the list of 12 is a man called Simon the Zealot. A zealot? A zealot? These are the guys who are out there with daggers and all, and they're trying to kill off the Romans, and they're gonna get in trouble for it. They're trying to have a revolution, and they're gonna do it with blood. They're gonna do it with power, and that's not the way Jesus plans, except by the death of himself, his own blood. And who was he paired with? Because here's the thing. The disciples are listed in the groups that they worked with. There's four groups of three, and then there's six groups of two. And the last man that's listed there who goes along with Simon the Zealot is another man who's more of a businessman professional. He's the one who does the books for the disciples. His name is Judas Iscariot. He's always identified as the one who betrayed Jesus. But folks, in this moment, what was he doing? Here's the funny thing. I've read several theologians this week, and they almost, without exception, almost every single one of them said, how would you have liked to have been paired with Judas? Because obviously he was a really bad, evil guy, right? Wait a second. He was a man whom Jesus anointed and gave power to preach repentance, to heal the sick, and to cast out demons just like he did the other 11. The Bible does not say he only did 11 because you know this one guy. He wouldn't have done him. No, he actually served through each of them. Here's one of the challenges. Men of God, people of God, sin and fail and fall. But that doesn't mean that God doesn't use them. And during that period of time, God was using Judas as well as all of the other 11 apostles. And he was doing it by the power that he gave them. Now, did Judas fall? Yes, he fell horribly. Did he reject Jesus? Very possibly. Is he in heaven or hell? God knows. And I would encourage you to follow his methods. But what we do know is, is that these 12 men, groups of two, Judas being one of them, went out empowered by God. Guess what? If a Judas can serve Jesus, can you? How bad do you have to be to say, I can't serve Jesus? If Judas could do it, then couldn't he also use you? If Judas could have the power of the Holy Spirit upon him, couldn't you also? Well, they were supposed to cast out demons. They were supposed to heal the sick. And as we're, they're doing this process of looking for reception, they're also supposed to be aware of and respond to rejection. And here's the thing. How many of you have invited somebody to come to worship, to come to something at church, vacation, Bible school, youth group, anything like that? How many of you have done that? Right? How many of you have somebody, when you invited them, they told you no? Okay? And when they told you no, you said, okay, go to hell, goodbye. <laughs> How many of you stopped inviting because they said a no? Come on, it's only two honest people. You've stopped inviting because they said no. Okay? The rest of you are still inviting people who have told you no. Is that true? So you've never had somebody say no that you've stopped inviting? Well, that's amazing. I'm surprised by that. Now I have to rethink what I'm supposed to share with you this morning. Because <laughs> here's the fact. There comes a time, and Jesus said it. 
There comes a time when you need to literally, straightforwardly say to a person, I'm shaking the dust off my feet. What did that mean? When a Jew came from a foreign country, any of the countries around Israel, a Gentile land, and they got ready to enter back into Israel, to the promised land, they would stop at the border, they'd shake the dust off of their clothing because of a, those gen, that Gentile dirt they didn't want on them, and they'd shake their feet off to get that Gentile dust off of them. Ah, now Jesus takes that image and he says, I want you to apply that a different way. Because he said, because do you remember who Jesus went to? He went to the people of Israel and he sent the disciples to speak to good Jews. And he says, if you don't get reception, if you get rejection, then shake the dust off and guess what? You let them know it. Folks, the purpose behind shaking the dust was to show in a tangible public way that that person now was responsible for themselves and not you. Jesus wanted to leave that, that burden of guilt on their shoulders and for you to let them know, I'm no longer going to talk to you about this. Here in Acts 13, it says, from Perga, they went on to Pisidian Antioch, and on Sabbath, they entered the synagogue, and Paul sat down, and, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women. The, the people were actually starting to listen, and, and they're about to follow what Paul is saying about Jesus Christ, and he's teaching about him. They're getting excited about him and the Jews get upset and look at what he says but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region so what did Paul and Barnabas do they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and they went on to Iconium as a warning, folks, there comes a point in time when you've been witnessing to somebody and the fact is you shouldn't just stop and kind of forget about them, but there needs to be that moment of time where you say to them, I have tried to talk to you about Jesus. I've shared what Jesus means to me, what he's done in my life, and I accept the fact that you are rejecting him. I accept the fact that you don't want to know Jesus. You don't want him in as part of your life. You don't believe he's real. I accept that. But I need to tell you also, and I love you and I care about you, I will never talk to you about Jesus again. I am going to leave you in your decision to reject him. And if you reject him and he's real, then you will miss out on heaven with him. Folks, it's serious business to shake the dust off your feet. And we need to realize it's serious business when we just stop inviting. Because when we stop inviting, we are shaking the dust off. We're just not telling them. And they're missing the opportunity to stop and say, wow, this friend of mine cares this much about me, and yet they're never going to talk to me about God again. Oh my goodness, this is, this is a big deal. And they need the opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work through that. And so he says, shake the dust. Shake the dust off as a clear warning to people. But folks, don't do it in judgment. Don't do it with a negative attitude. Don't do it. You know, you're stupid and you're never going to believe, so just go to hell if that's what you want. <laughs> you need to hear, and some of you might be troubled with me using that kind of language, but you need to hear that that's, it's that serious. And to shake the dust off is to allow them to make the choice between heaven and hell. Maybe we need to repent because we just stopped caring and stopped inviting because we didn't want to be rejected again. Lord Jesus.